Hebrews chapter 6, just briefly, Hebrews chapter 6, <clears throat> continuing here in the series, the foundation of, foundation of, Hebrews chapter 6, again, mentions some, uh, some points where the Apostle Paul said, this will be due if God permit, things that he thought to come back to and revisit. But he had more pressing matters of, of deep understanding to talk about the, to the Hebrew church. So therefore, for a moment, he left them aside. Hebrews chapter 6 and in verse 1, the Bible reads, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. And I'm saying the same thing. This we will do if God permit. If the Lord, if the Lord tarries, if the Lord allows, we will deal with the foundation of today, the doctrine of baptisms. The doctrine of baptisms. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Now, best I can see, and you notice here, it's not the doctrine of baptism. Okay, so it says the baptisms. So there's a plurality of baptisms mentioned in the scriptures, and I believe there's three that I can find specifically that I'd like to deal with today. The first being John's baptism. Look at Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Follow me, if you will, over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. So he's dealing here with John's baptism, which he says is of repentance for the remission of sins. Acts chapter 13, and in verse 22, it says, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Verse 23, Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior. When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people Israel. What is that then? What is this baptism of repentance? Turn with me over to Acts 19 and verse 4. We get a very clear definition. Acts chapter 19 and verse 4. Good to highlight this passage because Quite often people will say it's the baptism of repentance applies some sort of work to the salvation that John was preaching. But no, 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 it couldn't be further from the truth. Acts chapter 19 and verse 4 clearly says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And so the preaching of John before of the baptism of repentance was simply this. The people should believe on him which is to come. Believe on him that should come hereafter. And John's ministry we know as the Old Testament revealed was one of preparing the way of the Lord. Making his path straight. And so it makes sense then that John would have this type of baptism as part of his ministry. And you can go to my sermon that I preached in New Brunswick about John the Baptist uh, for a little more clarity on that. He was preparing the way of Jesus, preaching all that he that should come after, being the Lord, ought to believe on him. They ought to believe on him that should come hereafter. Go to John chapter 3 and verse 11. John chapter 3. You're going to have to have busy fingers today. John chapter 3 and verse 11. Because remember, even as we discovered last week, these aren't necessarily basic truths of the Bible, but these are foundational truths. And one of the foundations of our faith is that of the baptisms, doctrine of baptisms. John chapter 3 and verse 11 says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witnesses. John says, and I can't find it now. I think I wrote down the wrong verse. 
He says, I truly baptize with water. There cometh one after me whose shoes latched I am not willing or I'm not able to unloose. And I don't know where that is, but I'm going to continue on. Jesus, or uh, sorry, John was baptizing at this time with water, and he said there cometh one after that has another baptism, and that's of fire and of the Spirit. We'll get to that later. Turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to be quick because I'm, I know I'm going to run out of time today. Matthew chapter 21. And there in verse 23, it says, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders, Matthew 21, verse 23, and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And so there now, after John the Baptist, criticizing him and asking him, By what authority and who gave the authority to do what you are doing? Verse 24, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, okay, so obviously he coupled the, the, the scrutiny of Jesus here, and, and Jesus is going to bring to remembrance John the Baptist, the Baptist. He says, Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I will in likewise, or I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? from heaven or of men and they reasoned with themselves saying if we shall say from heaven he will say unto us why did ye not then believe him but if we shall say of men we fear the people for all hold john as a prophet and they answered jesus and said we cannot tell and he said unto them neither tell i you by what authority i do these things and so for us as the reader we can see that God here, through the exchange of the Pharisees and the elders of the people towards Jesus, is revealing that John's baptism very clearly was of heaven. John was sent as a prophet of God to perform his baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Baptizing people with water unto repentance and saying to them that they ought to believe on him which should come hereafter. It's shown that this baptism is authoritative or of heaven because Christ is given as the comparison. Very clearly, Jesus says, you know, I will tell you by what authority I do these things if you tell me if John's baptism was from heaven or of men. And we know Jesus came from heaven. And so what he's showing us is that very clearly John's baptism is of heaven, even though the Pharisees weren't willing to admit that. They weren't willing to give it the pro They weren't willing to answer one way or another because they feared the people and because they also did not want John to get credit as being a prophet. This also reveals that Jesus, too, had a baptism. But he first introduced this intermediate baptism and this is the one that we are most familiar with. So John came, his baptism was one that pointed unto the Savior. And it also says in the context of this scriptures um, that Jesus himself was baptizing. Look at John chapter 3 again. And in verse 22, John chapter 3, I should have had you keep your finger there. John chapter 3. And in verse 22, the Bible says, John 3, verse 22, After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. So that language clearly indicates that Jesus and his disciples are entering into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. Jesus both tarried and baptized. The language is clear there. So Jesus is performing a baptism at this time. And this is separate than the baptism of John because the very next verse it says, And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. So just a little clue there as to or just a little indication about baptism is it's one where much water is needed right so we're, we're not doing sprinkling we're, we're not we're not doing anything of that sort but baptism and the one that john did in particular was one where much water was required and it says in verse 24 for john was not yet cast into 
prison. Verse 25, it says, Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come unto him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Here he's also signifying his own baptism then was something from heaven. And even Christ is coming and indicating the same within this context. Now, it's interesting because the Jews come and they're asking about purifying. And that's where that idea of repentance the baptism of repentance for, because of the remission of sins, comes to play. Men were being baptized, confessing their sins, and then the Jews come and they're like, is this some sort of purifying ritual? They were confused about the baptism, which was revealed to John, I believe, from heaven. It was not something that they did in the same fashion. So they asked about, is this purifying? Is this another work of the law? Is this another, another deed or an outward show that we ought to do or follow after? But John was just saying that people were being baptized, confessing their sins, or that they were sinners indeed, and then they were being pointed to believe on Christ. And we do the same thing when we go to the door. We have people admit they're a sinner, confess their sin, that they're a sinner, and go on unto believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the first steps we deal with is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So purifying here is brought up. That's simply a mode of preparation for someone to believe on the gospel. They're preparing their hearts to understand that they are a sinner and lost and in need of that Savior which is to come in John's baptism. Now, this is not then a picture of us needing to take a bath and clean ourselves up before we can come to Christ. It's not like I need to get washed before I can come to Christ. No, Christ will take you just as dirty as you are, just as sinful as you are, just, just as you are. Come just as you are, Christ says. The type of baptism is not a cleaning up, but it's a preparation. This repentance then is simply that change of thought or of heart or of mind that couples with faith which is what's being symbolized here they're getting they're getting baptized unto repentance they're confessing that they're a sinner they're confessing their sins so that they can believe on christ they don't have to clean up their act before they come to him and this is what the work salvation is like to teach about john's baptism see they had to get clean they had to repent of all their sins then they could believe on him which is to come no no no. this is simply the repentance that change that comes coupled with faith and is put on christ repent and believe repent and believe is what the bible is teaching here repentance is simply that change i'm a sinner i need a savior okay now you're ready to believe on christ and that's what they were doing they were baptized as their symbol of understanding their need of a savior and again, John indicates that a man can receive nothing except it were given him from heaven. And so I believe John's baptism was one of heaven. It was ordained by God. John was sent forth to perform it. And that had a specific time in which it was to be performed. John baptized people unto repentance, saying that you should believe on him which should come hereafter. So John chapter 3 and verse 22 clearly said that Jesus was there, he tarried and baptized. Now if you turn over to John chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. So this here is indicating that in the time from John chapter 3 to now John chapter 4 in verse 1, I believe a change had taken place in that Jesus had now commissioned his disciples to do baptizing. Because in the parentheses there it says, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. But we see just previous that he clearly was baptizing at that time. Now by and large the disciples especially have taken over that ministry and there is the transition. It went from it went from John believing or John pointing people to the Savior to Jesus after he was baptized having having opportunity to teach his disciples so that they could carry on and what I believe is the next type of baptism and that's believers baptism go to Acts chapter 2 we'll learn about believers baptism this is the one that's most familiar to us that took place in this transition time Okay, so John pointed to the Savior. Now the Savior has taught the disciples in the act of 
believer's baptism. And we find this really takes off early on in the Christian church. Go to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 37. The Bible reads, When they heard this, and this was a big long sermon that was preached by Peter, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Peter says, Repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Ghost. This is what he charges these people to do. And I believe he had an understanding that they actually come to a saving knowledge of Christ through his preaching when he talks about how David uh, said, sit down till I make thine enemies thy footstool, that, that Christ had been exalted by the Father and the Holy Ghost. And he said, therefore, let all of Israel know surely that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. They're pricked in the heart. Peter says, repent. And in the same thing, that, that could be just said. And, and we don't say it because we get, we get uncomfortable with that term repentance. But you'll find quite often in the book of Acts, especially when he's dealing with Jews, he'll just say, repent, repent. And it's the same thing. You've changed your mind. You used to un not believe, now you've believed. And this is the same thing that's happening. Repent, believe, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Because of the remission of sins, ye shall receive the Holy Ghost hereafter. Now, verse 41, it says, and we talked about this before. It says, And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them. And all men and every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread, from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness his heart. And look at this praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. That phrase added to the church couples up with verse 41 where it says added unto them. It's the same group of people. Who are these people? Those that received the word, were baptized, continued steadfastly, had a singleness of heart. The church was made up then of saved, received the word, and baptized believers that continued in the same doctrine and had a singleness of heart and mind. This isn't the importance of baptism at this time is it's part of what we would consider church membership. It's part of what we would consider those that were added to the church. Those that are added to the church are those that are saved and baptized, continuing, have a singleness of heart and mind in the things of God here at this time. And so we continue on and we'll find Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. Now, if baptism is so important to the New Testament church, will we not expect to find it over and over and over and over in the book of Acts, which is all about the church and how it started and grew and spread abroad? Of course we would. Verse 8 talks about Saul consenting unto the death of um, Stephen at this time. The Bible says that Saul in verse 3, chapter 8 and verse 3, made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them unto prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And you know what? That may be what it takes. We're all in our houses now, right? We're all got, uh, assembled here and there and everywhere. Maybe God wants us to get out there and get his word out there and get the preaching going everywhere and shed abroad. I think some of the people that have gotten comfortable with the stay-at-home live stream church might find themselves in persecution. Lord willing, it drives them to start preaching the word here, there, and everywhere when persecution comes. Every time persecution comes, the church grows. Go to Acts chapter 8 then in verse 4. It says they went everywhere preaching the word. Verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. 
for unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And isn't that a great way to get puffed up if everyone's telling you you're the great power of God. You have that great power of God, right? And to him, verse 11, they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed, Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Okay, so it says very clearly that there's all these people that are bewitched by the sorcerer, but it says when they believed the preaching of Philip, which what was that? Well, it says in verse 5, he preached Christ. So when they believed the preaching of Christ, what's the first thing that was happening? The kingdom of God is, is proclaimed. The name of Jesus Christ was believed on. They were baptized, both men and women. The Bible says, and Simon himself believed also, and he was baptized and continued with Philip and wandered, beholding the miracles and signs that were done. We can continue on, and in verse 14 it says, When the apostles that were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. And of course, his, his, uh, his lust for money is revealed here. But I really wanted to focus on that point that they believed, and immediately after, they were baptized. Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Verse 13, And Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went he, his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes that had been scales and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. This is the great salvation story of the Apostle Paul. Scales fell from his eyes. He received sight and the Holy Ghost filled him. And in that moment, the first thing that he did forthwith, the Bible says, is he was baptized in that same fashion that we referred to when we talked about John. Much water being present. Dunked fully. You're not going to fool a Greek person with the term baptized. It means immersed. Okay, This is why there's that great split of the Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Catholic Church had a disagreement over baptism. Rome wanted to sprinkle. I guess they didn't have much water there. The Greeks said, baptize means immerse. <laughs> it means dunk. It literally means submerge. You can't, you can't fight that. But Rome and them and the Greeks, they split off. And it was because of that, because of baptism. It's a very important doctrine that I'm not saying the Catholic Church is anything great or wonderful. Of course, it's a wicked heathen institution. But the doctrine of baptisms is important to Christian faith. It's important to the Bible, and we ought to take it seriously. And so we see, again, an example of someone being saved, God calling him a chosen vessel, God indicating that he is going to do great things for him. I will show him great things that he must suffer for my name's sake. This is the great Apostle Paul. And the second he is saved... 
receives the Holy Ghost, scales fall from his eyes, and he can see clearly. He once was lost, now is found, was blind, and now he sees, he's baptized. Immediately after, forthwith, he arose and performed the baptism. Now, we do have here a case of Cornelius. And would to God we could all follow in the examples that we've heard so far. When they believed, they were baptized. Forthwith, they arose and were baptized immediately. And you know what? I don't think we've stressed that enough. And it's been perhaps a, a, a shortcoming of myself that when I get people saved, I don't, I don't have prepared for them the baptism presentation. Because the Bible teaches us that our commission is to get them saved, get them baptized, and get them perfect, get them grown, right? We too often get them saved and say, see you later. Maybe watch this on YouTube. Maybe check out this movie. Maybe read this document. Take a Bible. But we don't often enough encourage them unto believer's baptism. And I think we should. Because the Bible teaches a straight way. A when they believed immediately baptism as the ideal case. Now if you look at Acts chapter 10 and in verse 1, we're going to find the case of Cornelius. And this is an interesting one. Look at verse 1, Acts chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. And look at verse 2. A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Devout means one of deep religious commitment. The Bible says he feared God. Now, it says God, you know, the Lord God. This is, this is him. This isn't a God. This isn't just, just some God. This isn't an idol. No, he's devout, deeply religious, and committed to the fear of the Lord. The Bible says he prayed always. And of him also, verse 3, it says, He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. So another in interesting thing about Cornelius is not only is he devout, fears God, is praying, he's also receiving the word of God by means of an angel. He has revelations coming directly from God through his holy messengers. He receives the word. Verse 4 continues, it says, And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? Addressing the Lord, our Lord God. And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Amazing that this Cornelius is hearing from God, receiving from God, discussing with God, and God is hearing him, and they're having this exchange through prayers. His prayers have getting through. Now, we can continue on, and I want to show you the means by which a Cornelius was able to reach the Lord God. Look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. To him... Give all the prophets witness. Who's that? Look before. He was ordained of God to be judge of the quick and the dead. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. This is who he's talking about. To him. To who? Jesus. Give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And this is how a Cornelius could get a hold of God, pray to God, have visions and revelation come from God, be devout in serving God. And yet something by Cornelius was lacking at this moment. He believed, he received, he trusted the Lord, he believed on the Lord, which was to come. And I think what was lost on him was that he had already came. The prophets had revealed that he would come and he put his faith in what the prophets said. But then what happens next? Verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Watch this. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So we have here a Cornelius that I believe was saved at the time of his arrival. Under the preaching of God's word, Cornelius receives the Holy Ghost and those that are with them, and then he's admonished by Peter immediately to be baptized. This isn't a forthwith. This isn't an immediately. This isn't the moment he was saved baptism, but this is one much later. And I believe what happened here is that he finally had learned what baptism even means. And then 
yields himself to it and then is baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, fulfilling all righteousness as Christ called it when he was baptized of John. So this is an interesting thing and kind of a conundrum. What's first, the baptism and the receiving of the Holy Ghost or the receiving of the Holy Ghost and the baptism? Well, here in the case of Cornelius, he received the Holy Ghost and then was prompted by the preacher to be baptized. In another case, back in Acts chapter 2, they repented, they were baptized, then they received the Holy Ghost. I don't know what is it, it is about the order, but no matter what the order is, baptism always seems to be part and parcel with the reception of the Holy Ghost. Can we at least agree with that? Sometimes it's before. Maybe the Holy Ghost fell upon them first so Peter could actually come to the realization that God is no respecter of persons. He understood the truth of that. Then when he saw it before his eyes, them receiving the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, magnifying God, he said, yep, that verifies it. Get these guys baptized. And they were baptized in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord at this time. So whether or not it's the Holy Ghost first or the baptism first or the baptism first and the Holy Ghost first, we need to ask ourselves if we're saved and we're not baptized and we're wondering where the power is, maybe that's the missing link. Okay, baptism is vital to the Christian's start. Okay, my testimony is this, and everybody doesn't have the same testimony. I believed I had a little bit of the probably Acts chapter 2 type of baptism. Okay, I repented. I believed the gospel. I trusted Jesus. I spent a whole year reading the Bible by myself. I prayed to God. And do you know what he did when I asked him to have time to read his wonderful holy book, which I was such a truther that I was convinced New World Order was going to step in tomorrow and I'd never be able to read the Bible, okay? I was that paranoid in my mind, but I prayed to God. He got me into a car accident. I read that Bible through that first year about five times front to back. I had all of this knowledge. I had all of this understanding. I was praying unto God. I was hearing revelation from God. God was answering my prayers. It was great, but I was not baptized. And as a result, I feel that I did not have the power of the Holy Ghost in my life to do great exploits in the area of growth. I remained smoking. I remained drinking. I remained more or less my same lifestyle. Not much changed in that area. But then the time came after about a year of growing in knowledge, head knowledge of the word of God, I finally committed to getting into a Baptist church. And after a while there, I realized that I need to be baptized. I was baptized, and it was almost like the next day, things started to click as far as sanctification went. I was given power to overcome some sins. I started to be more convinced that things in my life were wrong. And my life started to clean up. And I started to have more grace and more love. More fruits of the Spirit were evident in my life. Man, that first year, I secluded everybody because I was full of knowledge. I was full of judgment. I was full of no, like know-how about the Bible, reading the Old Testament, and just, just being, being full of the letter of the law and, and not really having patience for people. But man, when the Spirit entered in when the Holy Ghost fell upon me, which was coupled, I believe, with my baptism, suddenly I was actually a decent person to be around. I wasn't just, you know, some people like to make the God of the Old Testament like wrath and vengeance and harsh and all this. And then, and then Jesus is, you know, love and light and all that. Well, God's both. That's the truth. But I really didn't exhibit much of the grace and mercy of Christ, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. I was full of myself. Knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge made me think that I was better than other people, and I showed other people that. I was self-righteous. But I was baptized, and when I was baptized, suddenly I made growth in the area of sanctification, and I started to show the fruits of the Spirit because I believed I repented long ago, and then after a while... Like Cornelius did, I repented, I, and after a while, I, I submitted to believer's baptism and was gloriously through the waters, and I started to grow in the area of Christian sanctification. So what is then believer's baptism? What is it in, in actuality? Go to 1 Peter, if you would, 1 Peter. Because if you really think about it, it's kind of an uh, anomaly. I mean... All of us have taken baths in our life, so why is God just kind of commanding us to, if you just look from the outside in, 
take a bath. You're just going underwater. You're just being dunked underwater. It doesn't seem like a big deal. Of course, if somebody had like a, a fear of water, it would be a bigger deal for them. If somebody was very self-conscious, it might be a bigger deal for them. People that don't like to stand in front of others and they get embarrassed and shy very easy, it would be a harder deal for them to be publicly baptized, of course. But at the bare bottom grassroots of it all, you're just getting dunked underwater. And all of us have done that at some point in our lives. So what's the deal with baptism? 1 Peter 3, look at verse 18. 1 Peter 3 and verse 18, it says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Look at that. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. By the which he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. Now look at this. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us and this not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says here that baptism is a like figure. It's a similar similar figure. It's, it's a picture of something. What is it? It's like Christ shows there in verse 18, being put to death in the flesh, quickened in the spirit. That's what the picture of baptism is. It's just like when the ark was preparing and the water comes in, they were saved through the water. It's a picture of something. It's a picture of something. And the interesting thing about it is here is it gives us when it should happen. The answer of a good conscience toward God. It's not putting away the filth of the flesh. So it's not you getting clean. It's not you washing away any sins. It's not you doing anything that is going to magically change you. Though I do testify that I was given power to change after I received my baptism. All baptism is in that moment is not putting away filth, but an answer of a good conscience toward God. How do you have a good conscience but to have it washed clean? You've got to be saved then. Once you're saved, your conscience is good. How do you answer with that good conscience towards God? You get baptized. It's that first step of obedience. It's that first answer of your good conscience towards God. And it took me a long time to answer with a good conscience toward God. And so my conscience was always kind of in the flesh. My conscience at, before I got baptized was always kind of doing things in the flesh. Now, what else is this a picture of? Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, a fine example of what believers' baptism is a picture of or a like figure of. Remember, it's an answer of a clean conscience or a good conscience towards God. It's not an action that actually puts away any filth, but it's simply you acknowledging the death of Christ and showing that as a like figure. And that's exactly what you're going to find in Romans chapter 6. I'm going to try not to dwell too long in here, but look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are, look at this, dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Okay, so the symbol or the like figure of being baptized into Christ or baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is you are symbolizing his death. You are baptized into his death. You are dead to sin, the Bible says. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And this is why we say when we're baptizing someone, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in newness of life. This is exactly what it is picturing. Christ died for us, was buried rose again to walk in newness of life. He, he was given his resurrected body at the time. And we act out that same thing in a like figure or in a picture when we yield ourselves, answer with a good conscience towards God to be active, act, to act out the death, 
burial, and resurrection of Christ. Buried in his likeness, raised to walk in newness of life. So it's an action where we show forth the death of Christ, his burial, and his resurrection through the baptism act. Verse 5, it says, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. It's acting out the promise that's to come. It's the same thing. When we are buried, the Bible calls it also planted. And this was why Christians generally don't practice cremation. We bury the body because it's a picture of a seed going into the ground that will one day arise in the likeness of Christ's resurrection. When we're being baptized, all we're doing is acknowledging by a sign, by a like figure, by a picture, by a type, that we died, buried, and we rose again. And that's an act of obedience towards God. He commands us to do the same. It continues on and says, knowing this, and, th and this is a pivotal truth. Th this, is, this is a foundational truth, but it's deep. And you can go to Colossians chapter 3 and learn more about this at another time, okay? Knowing this... That our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. And that's what we're picturing. That's what, that's what we're internalizing. That's what we're acting out. I was born again, I'm, but I died first. I was buried. I'm dead to sin. I have no need to live any longer therein, but I am raised to walk in newness of life. We need to know that the old man is crucified and dead. The body of sin should be destroyed. Henceforth, we should not serve sin because you're dead. You're freed from sin. Verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And that's where you have to transition. You have to understand that, hey, I'm dead to sin, but alive unto God. I've died, but I've rose again, and now I can walk in newness of life, alive with him. Verse 3, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And I love this verse. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, it's going to say at the end of this chapter. The wages of sin is death. So you don't, if you're not dead, you don't have to earn that wage anymore. If you're not trapped by sin, you have freedom from that and can go on and reap of that gift, which is eternal life through Christ, and we can reap of that now. Reckon yourselves. Believe it to be true. Pray about it every single day. Remind yourself, I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to sin. Reckon it to be so. However you need to do to just nail that down, put it on your doorpost, you're dead to sin. You're dead to sin. Remind yourself of that. Reckon it to be so. But you're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let therefore, let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as mem instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Do you know what baptism helps us out with? We don't often understand things just by reading it or just by hearing it. Do you know what helps us understand things sometimes? A picture, a type, an example, acting out something. I was explaining that to a gentleman the other day at the door. He's like, that seems so harsh that God would ask Abraham to offer his son Isaac upon the altar. And he lifted the knife and it was about to come down. And then the angel stopped him. He said, offer your son. He didn't say kill his son. Otherwise, Abraham would have been disobedient. But offer your son. And what did that do? The Bible said... He was justified by works at that moment. You know what that means? Is that everybody around him, it suddenly made sense to him what he was talking about. When he was talking about how God would offer himself. When he was talking about how God had promised him um, a seed multiplied as the stars of the sea. Everything that Abraham was talking about was just idle words to the people around him until he by faith acted it out and then his, by, he was justified by works at that moment. Why? Because they had a picture. They had an example. They had something that they could see. And baptism does the same thing for us. We need to remind ourselves that we're dead. We're alive unto God. How, what, what do we have to go back and remember that? We acted out publicly before people the death, burial, 
and resurrection of Christ. And when that happened, we were acknowledging that we're a new creature. We were acknowledging before God that we believe him, we're trusting him, we're following him by faith. And in that moment, you're reckoning yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So baptism then is a like figure. It's a picture. Believer's baptism I'm talking about. It's also a command. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. It's a command given to the church at large. Matthew chapter 28. The very end of the gospel of Matthew. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so God commanded that his church would have a threefold ministry in this world. The basic ministry of the church is to go and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teach them to observe all things that he has commanded them. A threefold ministry, pretty basic. We have it as our, our, our statement of faith, our mission statement to follow this great commission. And yet too often we forget about the second and third part. We go and we teach all nations the gospel, but we don't often try to get them baptized. We don't often try to get them to yield to that first step of obedience. Sure, we may try to teach them to observe all things, but in my testimony, I learned a lot of things, but I never actively put them to practice until step two was implemented and I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. This ministry is threefold. The Trinity isn't complete if one of the persons is missing. The commission isn't complete if one of the steps is missing. What if we were a church that only baptized and taught people but never led them to the Lord? What if we only lead them to the Lord and baptize and then they never grow beyond that? What if we only baptize what if we only baptize people and teach them things? We, we have something missing, and that's the power of the Holy Ghost in this church. And I believe, unfortunately, that, that we're often lacking that in our churches these days. The power of the Holy Ghost, the submission. And this is why this is another. Baptism is yet another foundational doctrine. It's the foundation of the doctrine of baptisms, which is pivotal to the Christian. Remember, if you're building on a shoddy foundation, your Christian life, you can throw all sorts of really nice things on that foundation. But if that foundation is weak and crumbles, it all crumbles and falls too. You need to watch that foundation. You need to keep that foundation. Our foundation needs to be sure. And the foundation of the church is threefold. Go and teach, baptize, and show them all things that Christ has commanded. Teach, baptize, and perfect the saints. And lo, I'm with you all the way even to the end of the world. And that's our commission until the end of the world. And so baptism is part of it. It's a like figure. It shows the death, burial, and resurrection. It's a command of God. And as a command of God, I believe we ought to take it very seriously. And I know that I have not done enough seriousness in this area. Now, we continue on and we can go to Acts chapter 19, if you would. Acts chapter 19. And we're going to get on to the next type of baptism. So we've talked about the baptism of John, which was say, uh, one of repentance for the remission of sins, saying that ye should believe on him, which should come hereafter. We have believer's baptism, which signifies that I have believed on him, which came before, died with him, rose again, right? It's an action that shows, shows that in my heart and, and in my life. And then we have here, and next, Jesus' baptism. Acts chapter 19 and verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come hereafter, that is, on Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And so they were baptized in John's fashion. And this is going to show you the transition, this, this portion of Scripture. They're baptized in the manner of John unto repentance, pointed to Christ, believed on Christ, received the gospel, were saved... 
but they hadn't received the Holy Ghost. Why? Because they weren't baptized in the name of Jesus. Oh, okay, I need to be baptized after believer's baptism. They take that step of obedience. They're baptized in the name of Jesus. They receive the Holy Ghost. And what happens? Look at verse 6. When Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And this, I believe, is the next step, verse 6. This is the baptism which John promised should come hereafter. And that's when he said, and you can go to Luke chapter, no, you turn to Acts chapter 1. And that is the baptism of the Holy Ghost and of fire. Luke chapter 3 and verse 16 says, There cometh one after, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay, so we have John's baptism, believe on him that should come. We have believer's baptism, which points back to that you have believed on him that should come. You receive the Holy Ghost. And here's Christ's baptism, which is that of the Holy Ghost and of fire. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. So the promise is that ye shall be baptized of the Holy Ghost not many days hence to this early church in the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 and we see the fulfillment. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place as he was commanded, as he commanded them to do, right? Verse 2 says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty wind, and a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the first thing that we need to notice, and that's what I believe believer's baptism is a picture of, is the obedience that happened. They were told to wait until the promise came, right? In Acts chapter 2, you find them waiting with one accord for the promise to come. Then enters in the Spirit as cloven tongues like fire, all of them are filled and immediately they go and begin to minister in the things of God, preaching with other tongues the wonderful truths of the gospel. Go to verse 17, it says, and it shall come to pass, this says, verse 16, sorry, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This baptism of the Holy Ghost and of fire is one of power to preach. It's one of power to minister. And it's one of power from on high. And that's the only way you can get it. And it starts with obedience. They obeyed. They received the power from on high. And then they went and they worked in that same power. The Holy Ghost and cloven tongues like as of fire are coupled together in this fulfillment of this baptism then. But I also believe that there's a baptism associated with this. The Holy Ghost is one of them, and that's what we focused on here. Though he appeared as of a fire, that's not exactly the fulfillment. But if you go to Matthew chapter 20, we're going to find out the second portion of this baptism, which is the baptism of fire. Matthew chapter 20, and in verse 20, the Bible reads, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And 
She saith unto him, or he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy kingdom. Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto him, Ye shall indeed you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. And, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority over them. Look at this. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. What is this indicating here? They asked if they could be given a special place of privilege. And Christ said, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they said, we are. And he said, well, don't exercise lordship. Don't think more highly of yourself as you ought. He says basically that the Gentiles exercise dominion, but among you it won't be so. Rather, here's the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. It is one that is going to make you into a minister. It's one that is going to make you into a servant. And it's one that in the end will make of you a ransom for many. Self-sacrifice is this baptism of fire. And it comes with tribulation and troubles and anguish. First Peter 4. 1 Peter 4 will be the last place that I go. 1 Peter 4. <clears throat> 1 Peter 4. And in verse 12. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice. Rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. This baptism that comes after our, yes, you know, fleshly baptism, where we're buried in the likeness of death and raised to walk in the newness of life. When you walk in newness of life, all those that live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, shall suffer persecution. At that time of your baptism, quite often the Holy Ghost comes upon somebody. In the book of Acts, it came with cloven tongues like as of fire. At that time also, Christ says, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? And he's indicating then that there will be fiery trials which enter into your life. You will be a minister. You will be a servant. You will be given as a ransom for many. The cup, the baptism, all this highlights the importance of that first step of obedience for us, which is being baptized in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. Two reasons why baptism is so important to the local church is, first of all, it promotes growth in the local church. It helps the church to fulfill the Great Commission. If you're a part of a local church and refusing to be baptized, you are not partaking of the same commission you're commanded to go out and do. Secondly, baptism could be that key to unlocking, let's say, spiritual power and growth in the life of the Christian. Because we see in many examples, baptism comes and at the same time, just before maybe, just after the Holy Spirit of God enters in and begins to move in great ways, begins to move somebody through his power to preach, to minister, to be a servant, to be a ransom for many, and to go in and through trials. This is all part of and the foundation of the Christian life and is just another, not basic, but foundational part of the Christian life and something we ought to take heed to. Take heed to your foundation. Make sure it's sure before you start building upon it these things. And it's never too late now to go back and inspect. If you're not baptized, go to a New Testament Bible believe in church and get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And see if it will not start you on a, a leapfrog rocket ship uh, pathway to great growth. If you are baptized, if you are saved, if you are part of a commission of church, 
uh, part of the Great Commission of the Church, bring new focus to that of baptism. Why? Because we need more Holy Spirit-filled, strong, growing, powerful, Holy Spirit-filled believers. And so we need to be focusing on that so we can have more people of one accord in the church doing the works, being ministers, being servants, ransomed for many, going through trials and overcoming them. We need more of that. This is foundational. And I'm thankful that God has revealed this to us. Paul gave us a list that we can go by and as the Lord wills, study these things out. Praise be to God for it.